Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us. I'm Chris Cervanek, the Associate Director at the Center for Civil and Human Rights here. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to you, um, Jose Aylwin. Professor Aylwin is a Chilean human rights lawyer who specializes in indigenous peoples and citizens' rights in Latin America. He is co-director of the Observatorio Ciudadano, or Citizens Watch, an NGO located in Temuco, which works to document, promote, and protect the human rights of indigenous peoples in Chile. Professor Aylwin also teaches on indigenous people's rights at the School of Law at the Universidad Austral de Chile in Valdivia. All of you who are Chilean or have lived in Chile, you know where these places are. They're in south of Santiago. He is a graduate of the University of Chile Law School and received his Master in Laws degree from the University of British Columbia School of Law. And as evidence of Professor Aylwin's excellent work and reputation in the human rights community, he serves as a member of the board of the country's preeminent human rights body, the National Institute for Human Rights. As I know well from my time working in Chile, and I'm sure others, los chilenos in the room, agree, Professor Aylwin is one of the most respected human rights professionals in Chile. He's also the son of Chile's first post-dictatorship leader, a giant for human rights there, President Patricio Aylwin. Aylwin. We're honored to have Don Patricio's son here with us today. And he will speak on human rights and constitutional reform in his country. Please join me in welcoming Professor Edwin. Thank you, Chris, and, and thanks so for the center for inviting me to, to give a, a talk to share my perspective on, on a specific topic on human rights in, in Chile. I know it's not the best day to be here, but that's a uh, um, consequence of the fact that I was, I'm coming from two conferences in Canada, and um, I'm here also on an invitation of Father Tim Scully, um, who's a good friend of mine for a long time, and he's leaving for Chile on Wednesday, so the only possibilities were Monday and, and Tuesday, and and, um, and I know that you're anxious about um, your domestic reality rather than uh, than on the uh, context of Chile. But so so I appreciate the, um, enormously the fact that you're here today. Uh, when I was invited to to give a talk, I thought about which topic could, could be of interest uh, for you. Um, and um, the, the, and it came to my mind that, that the uh, constituent process which is taking place in, in Chile these days uh, from a human rights perspective might be an interesting, uh, uh, the most interesting topic to refer to. Uh, because it, uh, it talks of the challenges that uh, transitions to democracy that uh, um, regional um, that, that it, uh, democracies in Latin America uh, and about the changes and reforms that have taken place in recent years th throughout the Americas. So I have made this uh, presentation, uh, Human Rights and Constitutional Reform in Chile, uh, Lessons from Contemporary Chile. Um, so, Last year, in 2005, President Bachelet announced this constituent process for the elaboration of a new political constitution for Chile. This, as she said, through a process she defined as democratic, participative, and institutional. Although this came uh, as a surprise for many, taking into account the fact that constituent processes leading to, to the enactment of new constitutions generally occur in context of big political or economic crisis, which could be argued it's not the case in the Chilean context today. The demand for a new political constitution, which could replace the constitution in effect in 80 during the Pinochet regime, regime, is not new. This demand can be traced back to 1980 in, in the context of the debate of uh, uh, the constitution which was being imposed through a fraudulent, fraudulent referendum 
by uh, Pinochet, without, without electoral registry, with no media, no freedom of speech. When former President Frey, who was after murdered by the Pinochet by regime, called to the creation of a constituent assembly as a means to democratically elaborate a political constitution for the country. <coughs> But for several years after the restoration of democracy in 1990, when more than 30 reforms to, to 200 provisions of the Constitution were uh, introduced to enable transition to democracy, including reforms dealing with the subordination of the armed forces to the executive, the end of the appointed senators, including the former heads of the army, the role of the Constitutional Tribunal, among others, this demand was then shelved from 1990 on. However, it re-emerged in recent years as a consequence of, of social discontent triggered by social inequality, lack of trust in political institutions, as well as cases of corruption. In 2011, hundreds of thousands of students demonstrated in streets of the most crowded or the most important cities of Chile, demanding free and quality public higher education. Their demand also included the enactment of a new constitution as a precondition for dismantling the key features of the economic model that had resulted in the privatization of higher education institutions. In the presidential elections of 2013, in which was President Bachelet was elected, uh, social movements called to manifest their demand for a new constitution in their votes. 10% of the voting sites that were observed were scratched uh, with vote, the votes with the letters AC, meaning Asamblea Constituyente. The demand for a new political constitution is not only related to its fraudulent origin, but also due to the protected nature of the democracy it has established regardless of the many reforms to which I referred that have been introduced since the 1990 on. Um, among the most complex provisions or restricted provisions of the existing constitution, the following are to be mentioned. Those that establish a system of supra-majoritarian quorum for constitutional reforms, two-thirds or three-fifths, as well as those a supra-majoritarian quorum for the enactment of the so-called constitutional laws, four-sevenths of, of Congress. Until 2015, the electoral system elect, in, in effect was a binomial electoral system which generated equal representation of the two large political conglomerates and resulted also in the exclusion of those political sectors which were not part of those two large political conglomerates. For instance, indigenous peoples in Chile representing 10% of the population have no representation at all in Congress. Third, the so-called preventive control of the constitutionality of law projects by Chile's constitutional court, a mechanism that regularly has been used by political sectors that supported Pinochet as a means to block legislation adopted by the majority in Congress. So there's a, this third instance that uh, supervises the constitutionalities of laws that are enacted by a democratically elected entity, Congress, and that generally uh, identify unconstitutional uh, sections of those legislations and are able to uh, impede their uh, enactment or approval. Other critical provisions of the Constitution are those that provide strong protection to private property and disencourage state participation in, in economy. And in contrast, the, lack, the Constitution lacks protection to economic, social and cultural rights. The protected nature of the democracy uh, established in 1980 Constitution is reflected in the words of Pinochet's chief advisor on the constitutional process which took place at that time, Jaime Guzman, who admitted at, that time, at the time of the drafting of this constitution that the objective of, of this uh, uh, chart was that if adversaries managed to govern 
the country, they will be constrained to follow a course of action not too different to that which we could decide. So, in practice, it was a protected constitution that uh, meant that if those in opposition to the Pinochet regime came uh, to power, they could not do much or more differently than they, those who supported uh, the Pinochet regime, would do. So regardless of its reforms, the constitutional framework, in effect, has resulted in wealth concentration <coughs> in few economic groups. A key instrument of wealth accumulation has been the privatization of the pension system, which is controlled by a few conglomerates that after 35 years in operation has resulted in the accumulation of 165 billion US dollars, which have been forcibly obtained from workers. The pension system privatized in 1980 mandates that all laborers uh, which entered into the labor force after 1980 are obliged to pay uh, to the pension, private pension entities uh, their 10% uh, um, of their salaries. And this has resulted in a huge concentration of uh, funds in these private corporations. In contrast, the armed forces kept the public system for uh, the as the, the social security system for the different uh, bodies of the armed forces and their pensions, the pensions that they obtain are uh, eight times the average of the pensions that are received by uh, non, by civilians who are forced to, uh, um, to stay in, in the private pension system. The income difference between the richest and poorest 20% uh, stands at 14, at a rate of 14 to 1, one of the most unequal in Latin America and the most unequal of the OECD uh, of Chile, of which Chile became a part of in 2010. Also, and in relation to this, the lack of credibility in political institutions has grown increasingly in recent years. In the last poll uh, undertaken by the United Nations Program on Development, UNDP, the credibility of the government reached 13%, that of the parliament reached 8%, and that of political parties was as low as 4%. So the lack of credibility, in particular of parties, is also reflected in the abstention in electoral processes. While in 1989, in the first elections after the military regime, uh, the percentage of the population of the electorate that voted reached to 90% in the last municipal elections of, uh, of last October, the percentage of voters uh, reached only to 35%. So there's, uh, this re reflects the lack of credibility in the uh, electoral system and in political parties. So it is probably due to this lack of credibility and legitimacy that led President Bachelet uh, for, uh, to include uh, and to call for a new constitution as part of one of her main pillars in uh, her research um, uh, government program uh, in, uh, for a second term in, in office after his first term from 2006 to 2010. So his program uh, was elaborated in 2013 and she was elected for a mandate of four years, starting in 2014. But this constituent process, as President Bachelet has uh, called it, has uh, important challenges from a human rights perspective. The constitutional building process, however, uh, poses relevant challenges from human rights. The process leading to the enactment of the Constitution and the content of the constitutional text are the central challenges that I visualize on this process. From a human rights per perspective, the process for the elaboration of the constitutional text is possibly more important than the content itself. This is a consequence of the conception that the originary, that there is an originary constituent process which is vested in people or to make it more complex in the context of the Americas, of peoples that live there. And peoples have 
the freedom to provide themselves with a legal and political order through a constitution having respect for human rights as the only limit for this process. This is not a new a conception. More than 200 years ago, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizens of 1793 in France welcomed this doctrine by stating the people always have the right to revise and reform and change the constitution. A generation cannot impose its, law, its laws to future generations. This principle is also um, uh, part of the Convention on Civil and Political Rights, Article 1 of this convention, as well as of the Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights of the United Nations, affirm that all peoples have the right to self-determination, and by virtue of this right they freely determine their political status and pursue their economic, social and cultural development. The UN Human Rights Committee, in a specific observation, in a general observation on the right to self-determination, has affirmed, has stated that with regards to this matter, that the uh, right to self-determination and the way through which it, it is implemented should also be reflected in the processes leading to the enactment of a new constitution. So as a consequence of a growing acceptance of this conception in modern democracies is that constituent assemblies have emerged as the most suitable and adequate mechanism and more consistent with human rights. And it's the most frequent mechanism used, used in comparative ex experiences for the elaboration of political constitutions. As the Kenyan constitutionalist Yash Gai points out, determination of the mechanisms for the elaboration of a constitution must take into consideration that these are not only legal instruments, but moreover, they are agreements between those who form uh, the state, whose purpose is to ensure the social, ethnic, and democratic coexistence of a society. He adds, from a political perspective, the constitutional text is not an end in itself, but a process that looks to the future. Consistent with his view, he states, that constituent assemblies are the most appropriate form for constitutional building uh, in, sta in, in modern states. Their inclusiveness can open, he adds, prospects for reconciliation of different communities who feel marginalized by existing political system. So these uh, notions of the uh, originary power to elaborate a, a new constitution coming from the people or from the peoples uh, has been adopted by many states uh, worldwide and in Latin America. In the case of Latin America, 14 out of 28 constitutions enacted in the second half of the 20th century have been elaborated through constituent assemblies. Several states did not consider in their former constitution this mechanism. Uh, however, uh, they have been um, established or by the executive power or by legislative power and on many occasions, on several uh, occasions, they have been legitimized by the judiciary due to the fact that the existing constitutions did not consider this mechanism as a way to reform or to build a new constitution. In the context of Chile, however, it is still uncertain who will draft the new constitution. Bachelet proposed five steps for the constituent process she called last year. Starting from a, a civil education uh, process which took place earlier this year, uh, through media and through campaigns, uh, educating people of what a constitution is, uh, then the, the following process or the following step was um, a constitutional, the call for a constitutional dialogue uh, to involve citizens' participation whose results would give origins to the so-called citizens' basis for a new constitution by the end of this year. These uh, constitutional dialogues were for many a surprise uh, due to the fact that um, different sectors of societies, particularly large political conglomerates, conglomerates did not have uh, a lot of expectations uh, on this constituent process and moreover on these constitutional dialogues. However, more than 2,000 <coughs> uh, 
people participated throughout the country uh, in small uh, meetings, up to 15 people, in regional meetings and in provincial meetings, and then uh, gave, um, were systematized uh, by uh, uh, an independent body uh, and uh, um, came up with different proposals on issues including the values of a new constitution, the institutions that could, should be uh, included in a new constitution, and uh, the rights and duties which, which should be considered in, in that constitution. But Pachelet's proposal considers a third uh, stage, um, which is the presentation by her government to Congress of a project for a new constitution in 2017. Parallel to that, she will also send to Congress a bill reforming the current constitution that does not consider a mechanism for uh, um, outside of these supramajoritarian quorums for, a, for a, the elaboration of a new uh, constitution, which will reform the new constitution uh, to allow uh, Congress, in according to the existing uh, constitution uh, provisions, to choose between the different forms through which a new constitution could be elaborated. And the mechanisms that she uh, um, already has uh, uh, <coughs> mentioned uh, that Congress will have to choose uh, among is a bicameral commission composed of current deputies and senators, a joint constitutional convention of uh, members of parliament and citizens, a constituent assembly or a referendum so that citizens themselves can decide between the three options before mentioned. The rationale of leaving the decision of this mechanism for a, to, for a new constitution to the next Congress, this will be um, the, the, the Congress that will decide one of these options as a mechanism for the elaboration of a new constitution is the, the Congress that will be composed will be formed in 2018. It's due to the fact that the electoral system in effect has been revised and reformed and the binominal electoral system to which I refer to that elects uh, only two representatives by each district will be amended uh, by a, a proportional electoral system which means that each district will elect uh, a number of uh, uh, senators or deputies in accordance to their demography, which could go from two up to five representatives in each district. So this will give uh, a more broader representation in Congress, and that is the Congress that will have to decide the mechanism through which the new constitution will be elaborated. So the constitution, now the constituent process will finish with a binding referendum to be held in 2019 for the ratification of the new constitution by citizens. But the challenges uh, that this process faces are many. There are serious doubts as to whether President Bachelet herself has the leadership to finalize this process, taking into consideration that her popular support or that the credibility of her government currently uh, is of 13% of the population. A process leading to the enactment of a new constitution, new social agreement reflected on a fundamental chart needs a leadership and a president with such a low uh, credibility and such low popularity uh, is difficult that can lead the process to the enactment uh, of uh, uh, that new constitution. On the other hand, the decision on the mechanism uh, that will be adopt, finally adopted uh, for the elaboration of a new constitution will still, notwithstanding, it will be in a Congress composed in a proportional, uh, through a proportional electoral system, will still need a supramajoritarian quorums of three fifths of the Congress uh, to uh, decide this mechanism uh, and. There are some doubts as to whether these quorums will enable, for instance, the decision of a, a, 
uh, a constituent assembly as the mechanism uh, for the elaboration of uh, the new constitution. Finally, some reflections on the contents of a new uh, constitution. And as said, uh, the, the, from a human rights perspective, the process leading to the elaboration uh, and to the approval of a new constitution is probably more important than the content itself. You cannot decide prior to defining the, the mechanism, which the contents are, because the originally constituent power vests on the people or vests in, in the peoples, such as in the context, in the context of a diverse uh, states as, as the states of the Americas. So uh, you cannot restrict the sovereignty of that uh, power by identifying previously which the contents of uh, that constitution might be. But from a human rights perspective, it is, it is interesting to look at the contents of new constitutions elaborated in different contexts in, in, in recent decades. Um, in the context of Latin America, uh, the um, Colombian constitutionalist, Rodrigo Uprimni, who is currently uh, a member of the UN Committee on Social, Economic and Cultural Rights, among, identifies among the most important features of uh, new constitutions elaborated in the last three decades in Latin America, the recognition of civil and political rights, and as well as economic, social, cultural rights, and related to that, the inclusion of international treaty rights in the so-called uh, constitutional bloc. That means that international treaties or human rights considered in international treaties are adopted by this modern constitution as part of the constitution itself and have a constitutional hierarchy which prevails uh, over uh, legislation of, a, of an inferior hierarchy. The inclusion of mechanisms or remedies for the protection of constitutionally protected human rights, including the justiciability of social, economic, and cultural rights, uh, which is a big challenge due to the fact that social and economic and cultural rights such as health, education, housing, uh, are not generally, uh, um, the, 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 it is not possible generally to, to claim their, the, um, the exercise or the fulfillment of the, these rights through, through, judiciary, through, through judicial mechanisms. And also another feature common to uh, new uh, constitutions in Latin America is the strength, the strengthening of social participation through the inclusion of different mechanisms such as referendums, the pop popular initiative of law, that means uh, a number of uh, um, citizens can uh, demand, uh, can subscribe a petition uh, for the elaboration of law. So the law initiative is not only uh, vested in, in the executive power, in the, in the government or in the legislative power, but also on, on citizens. The revocation of mandate whenever um, a president uh, um, does not um, uh, fulfill or comply with, with uh, um, constitutional provisions, thereby facilitating the transition from a representative democracy to a participatory democracy. And finally, the revision of the concept of nation, giving way to the recognition of ethnic and cultural diversity existing in Latin American states. And it is it, it, with regards to this last uh, matter and to this last issue, which is so relevant for Latin American states, that I would like to reflect on this uh, last part of my presentation. Uh, because it, it has been in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, through the processes of elaboration of new constitutions, that diversity, particularly referred to indigenous peoples, but also to Afro-descendants, has become uh, an issue which has been dealt by uh, constitu the constitutions of most states in, in Latin America, who currently acknowledge this diversity uh, in different ways.
Raquel Irigoyen, a Peruvian jurist and anthropologist, ident identifies three cycles in constitutional processes that have taken place in Latin America with regards to indigenous peoples. The first of which took place in the, in the 1980s and were the consequence of civil wars, of democratization processes such as those that took place in Guatemala, uh, eh, which uh, drafted a constitution, enacted a constitution in 1985, Nicaragua uh, after the uh, Sandinista revolution, which enacted a constitution in 1987, and Brazil after the military dictatorship in 1988. The three constitutions enacted in the 80s acknowledge for the first time the existence of the so-called indigenous populations or indigenous communities and some rights, particularly cultural rights and rights to land. But there's a second way that's identified by Raquel Irigoyen uh, of constitutional reforms that go beyond that frame of uh, recognition to acknowledge the existence of indigenous peoples as such, the pre-existence of these peoples to the states and by acknowledging the pre-existing of these peoples, it also acknowledges that these rights are inherent. So they're before they, they, these rights are vested on them, uh, not by the creation of states, but pre-existed to them. And the recognition of rights to lands, resources, rights to pol special political representation in Congress, in, in states such as Colombia and Venezuela, and in some cases, rights to autonomy. These reforms uh, were, took place from the Andean countries up to Mesoamerica and, and Mexico, particularly in the 1990s and early 2000s. Finally, there's a third cycle of reform that took place, that has taken place in the last decade, particularly in the Andean countries of Ecuador and Bolivia, countries of, of a large indigenous demography uh, that uh, took place, uh, as said, in the, in the year 2000, in Ecuador in 2008, and in Bolivia in 2009. This, uh, both states dismantle the notion of the nation state by acknowledging that these states are plurinational. So this means that these states are not only composed of one nation. Uh, and according to that, uh, established mechanism through which these nations have specific rights uh, in different, uh, um, um, referring to different dimensions of their lives, including rights to autonomy, rights to self-determination, rights to lands and, and uh, resources, rights to uh, uh, their own legal systems and to their own judicial systems as part of the uh, uh, frame of, of the state. They also uh, propose, unlike the constitutions enacted in the 90s that propose multiculturalism as the frame for the relation of different peoples and ethnic groups within states, these constitutions propose the notion of interculturality, interculturalidad, as a form of relationship between different peoples. For instance, uh, um, rights to good living uh, are acknowledged by a, a concept which came from the Quechua notion of Sumat Kausai, is acknowledged by the constitutions of Ecuador and Bolivia, challenging the idea that states should only promote development as the goal of, of society, but uh, rather should encourage different forms of good life, meaning good life in relation to uh, people, to peoples, to nature. And they also, in the, in the case of Ecuador, they promote or, or they acknowledge the rights to nature uh, as a right uh, which questions the, the paradigm that rights are only vested on individuals or, or peoples. So um, this uh, process that has taken place in recent decades throughout the Americas are of great relevance in the context of Chile, a society that uh, has a, an important ethnic diversity where 10% of the population self-identifies themselves 
as indigenous and are still uh, today uh, the most uh, uh, marginalized groups of, of society. So these are some of the challenges that from a human rights perspective and from a political perspective uh, I visualize a, a for the constituent process which is taking place in Chile that I wanted to share with you. Thank you. This is a big uh, issue worldwide, and as you know, uh, although uh, international human rights law uh, uh, and the United Nations itself and the Inter-American Human Rights System acknowledge the indivisibility of human rights and the fact that states are responsible for um, the, the compliance of both civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights, there's different views on this matter. And, um, and some of these views are being uh, uh, reflected today in the, in the citing places of the US, because this is a global issue. The, the UN covenant on, civil, uh, on economic and social and cultural rights affirms that states have the responsibility to fulfill uh, social economic rights and to uh, devote the most resources they can to fulfill uh, economic, social and cultural rights. The com comparative um, uh, international, I mean constitutional law uh, in the Americas but also in in, in Europe, uh, consider economic, social, and cultural rights as <coughs> binding responsibility of states. <coughs> uh, there are some states uh, that have gone further to establish remedies or mechanisms through which uh, <coughs> the state can, can, can be, I mean, the, 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 the um, compliance with this, this right can be made can be taken to courts, it can be uh, justiceable. Um, however, there's no, um, th th there's no, um, uh, th 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 this is a matter of many different um, uh, ideas and, and, and perspectives. Uh, I believe that the economic, social and cultural rights should be not only in the Constitution, but there should be mechanisms to uh, make that should allow uh, individuals and collectives to uh, to demand the fulfillment and compliance of social, economic, and, and cultural rights. There are other views that affirm that that would be a consequence of uh, the economy and that the the possibility of fulfilling. Uh, implementing social, economic, and cultural rights will depend on uh, on the, the uh, um, compliance on, on, on the performance on the economic performance of states meaning that uh, poor states cannot uh, comply with social, economic, and cultural rights and, and wealthy or rich states 
can comply with these human rights. I don't share that, that view. <coughs> and, um, and another dimension which, in my opinion, should be included in a constitution uh, is the right, which is not, uh, which comes from a liberal background, is the, uh, the notion that uh, individuals have the right to choose that, 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 that there should be space for private health, for private social security, uh, or private <laughs> housing. But there should also be space, and the state should ensure that the, that the state, uh, that the people can choose uh, a public um, social security system, a public uh, health system, uh, a public higher education system, and, and that the state should provide, should ensure that those who choose the, 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 the state uh, system are uh, supported and have access to these social and economic and cultural rights. Yes? I think I'll pray the first. Okay, right, right, thank you. Um, well, on, when you talked about the proposals on what kind of uh, rights should be recognized by the Constitution, I um, I started to think about um, how hard it's going to be to agree on that in the in the, in the constitutional um, uh, assembly. The, so, what is your opinion on including general clauses on uh, constitutionality block or in, or incorporating international uh, law into the into the bloque de constitucionalidad? Uh, to for the courts to decide the extent of the of the of the rights being recognized and you know because I, I think this discussion yeah. will will yeah will uh, arise in the in the constitutional assembly yeah definitely as I said uh, in my presentation um, the I mean the contents of the constitution are have to be dealt with and have to be reflected and agreed upon by by this body. Uh, uh, that, that's from a human rights perspective that is central. I mean, uh, just uh, as a matter of information, in the context of this process called by the president, uh, uh, who was um, rejected by, by several sectors, uh, entrepreneurial organizations started drafting a constitution former presidents, uh, both conservative and center-left, started drafting that this is what the Constitution should look like. Uh, and these, of course, I mean, might be interesting contributions, uh, but, but you cannot uh, uh, yeah, predefine what the contents is. Having said that, there's also a reflection on the minimalist and maximalist, that's the adequate word, of a Constitution. Uh, uh, with regards to different topics. And of course, Latin America has a, a maximalist uh, approach. And, and that's been questioned, and of course, uh, the US has a, a different stand on this and, and uh, is very proud of a core set of values and principles and rights that, that are there and gives uh, space for courts uh, uh, and for the, the Congress to to, to uh, develop those those uh, rights. Uh, um, it would be difficult for Chile with the Latin American tradition that that, that uh, of which it, it's part to have a minimalist constitution. I don't see the minimalist constitution as an option. I don't see either the maximalist uh, approach as as the only way to go. There should be something in between. And with regarding specifically to your uh, question, uh, that, that is a possible option. Uh, I mean, to uh, establish, I mean, because most of the civil and political rights that our constitutions recognize, and the social and economic and cultural rights that our constitutions 
at least a Chilean one, does not acknowledge, are the core of these uh, international human rights treaties. Uh, and, and that's an interesting way to um, include them and then to insert, insert these rights in, in, in the Constitution. However, what makes it more difficult is, is the justiceability and the enforcement of these rights. Uh, uh, the Constitution of Ecuador uh, establishes, acknowledges not, not only that uh, international treaty bodies are, are just as well, but also establishes that um, a specific um, remedy uh, that allows individuals uh, to um, demand the, the, the state uh, the, to enforce, to make it enforce the, the, these rights, uh, including uh, a, the Constitution refers to the interpretation the, of treaty bodies and the um, observations made by treaty bodies and even the recommendations and, and statements made by treaty bodies. Uh, but that in practice doesn't work well. And, and um, maybe I should have referred to the fact that um, these two last constitution that uh, generated lots of expectations uh, uh, among different marginalized sectors have generated also lots of frustrations because these states, refer to Ecuador and Bolivia, uh, notwithstanding these uh, rights that have acknowledged, uh, particularly to its diversity, to its indigenous peoples, uh, in many ways are not respecting these rights and, and rights to good living are more a resort uh, than a, a practice because in practice these states are still trapped by the notion of development and extractivism and rights such as self-determination that are, is being acknowledged to indigenous peoples are not being respected. So, and to end up responding to your question, uh, I, I think that the, the recognition should go beyond uh, the uh, recognition of uh, these treaties uh, as being part of the constitutional bloc, uh, at least in terms of uh, ensuring mechanisms to make, make them enforceable. I have about 30 questions, but I'll start with one. Okay. Um, you mentioned that one of the issues that's leading to this process is the constitutional review of democratically elected legislation. Of course, in the United States, we have judicial review of the constitutionality, and many countries do. Uh, were you or someone objecting to the notion of constitutional review, or is there a particular problem with the form of it in Chile? Um, there's two... No, the, the, the answer is no. I, I, I don't oppose to a constitutional review of legislation. But there's two matters of concern uh, with regards to the Chilean constitutional revision process. The first is that a large part of the members of the, this constitutional tribunal are not democratically elected and they supervise decisions that are, are made by a body which has limits in its democratic election due to these binominal electoral systems, but are elected by the people. The second is that they are, to say uh, openly, they are the guardians of the Pinochet constitution. So they are supervising that uh, the core of this authoritarian constitution, which is still in many ways uh, in effect, will not be changed. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if uh, that answers your question, but I definitely do not oppose uh, constitutional review of legislation, but, but you have to take into consideration the, the, these two facts that, that make questionable the, the exercise that, that, they, uh, that they do. Yes. Um, I have a question um, about, uh, because a lot of your discussion involves uh, protecting rights and 
in development of the constitution, how much do you think that Chile would be allowed to truly develop that from within the country as opposed to with pressure from uh, the UN or from other international entities? And in particular, I'm thinking about the right to life because Chile is unique in that it's one of the few countries left that prohibits abortion. Mm. Um, and I know under Bachelet, there's a big movement to expand access to that, and that's also um, part of the pressure with the constitutional changes, because in the constitution, it protects the right to life. Mm. Um, but, of course, an easy argument for that being the constitution is that that constitution came from Pinochet. So I guess I'm curious that, on the one hand, how Chile will be able to preserve its own understanding of human rights as opposed to being pressured, and then in particular how you think this movement would affect uh, Chile's stance on the right to life? Big question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, with regards first a bit more general comment on, on the influence on international treaty body influence in decision-making process. Uh, um, I, I would say that, um, I mean, Chile has not been listening in many different matters. Uh, international treaty bodies uh, on human rights. I mean, not only on right to life and its different interpretations, uh, but, but on social and economic and cultural rights the ILO observations on rights to unionize, uh, labor rights, uh, um, the rights of indigenous peoples, which are, I mean, one of the most uh, critically assessed by, by the UN treaty bodies. So, so I, I mean, I don't have an answer to how these uh, Treaty bodies will influence the constituent process. My, I mean, as you have uh, um, listened, I mean, my from a human rights perspective, I, I I am in favor of a constituent assembly as the only means to build a, 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 an inclusive, democratic uh, uh, constitution for the future of, of Chile. Uh, if that happens, which is uncertain, which was my main one of my main points, and um, it depends on who will compose that that uh, constituent assembly um, and how they will consider these uh, international trends, uh, recommendations, and so on. Second reflection is on the right to life. I mean, I don't have a problem in the. I mean. Not at all. I mean, I totally favor the protection of the right to life, uh, constitutional protection. But but um, but the right to life has um, to be interpret interpreted in, in in different ways. And and the, the challenge here is not necessarily uh, the uh, the protection of the right, the recognition and protection of the right to life, but how it has been interpreted among others, by uh, the Constitutional Tribunal uh, in a very restrictive manner uh, by not acknowledging the comparative law on this matter and the, although I have to admit and this is an issue that it's always brought to the attention of the uh, National Human Rights Institute uh, of whose board I'm a part of, there's no uh, it's not a very clear international definition on the right to life and and uh, and uh, and abortion as related to. Uh, so um, so I would say um, maybe I'm wrong, but this is a matter which, going back to your question, should that should not necessarily. Be defined by the constitution itself, uh, but rather through legislation or through courts, but through courts which are <laughs> uh, 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 through the uh, constitutional tribunal. But 
not the constitutional tribunal that we have. movement to change the constitution and idea to change a constitution that was created under a dictatorship just because it was created at that time or because the con that constitution is substantially wrong or bad yeah. because for the last like the past 20 years you have been under that constitution and I see that Chile is doing well like not very, very bad, or it's just that you want to have like your constitution under a democratic regime, which will be, in essence, what you have right now, yeah. but just with some amendments. Well, of course, this is at the center of the debate uh, 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 on the constitutional, on the constituent process, which is taking place in, in Chile these days. There's some sectors, including some sectors of the, um, of the government coalition, that say, well, we're doing fine. Uh, why do we need uh, a new constitution? And of course, uh, the, the conservative parties, uh, I mean, oppose the idea of a new constitution. However, I said that they don't want to be left outside. So, so now that everybody's talking about a new constitution and they, they, they're drafting their new, uh, hoping that it, it would be in controlled spaces that a new constitution would be drafted. Um, there is uh, an issue of legitimacy and, and a concern that deals with how the constitution was enacted, although, as I said, 30 reforms, 200 articles, it has been importantly uh, reformed, revised. That the country is doing well, there is many different uh, analyses or reflections that could, could be mentioned. I, I started by saying there's not a big crisis, political crisis, or, e or even an economic crisis. Because it, I mean, Chilean economy has ranked, I mean, has been the, I mean, the, the leading economy in terms of attracting foreign investment, in terms of macro in economic indicators, in terms of um, <coughs> income per capita, and so on. But I also reflected and I shared, um, I mean, uh, some... Uh, um, statistics information showing the, the other uh, uh, dimension that and the other side effects or effects of the current uh, constitution. I mean, the, the accumulation of wealth uh, is a consequence of a constitution. I haven't referred to other aspects and would be too long, but the constitution basically opens to the privatization of natural resources, subsurface resources, water resources. And, uh, so the accumulation of wealth in few uh, hands has been uh, really enormous. And, uh, and they reflect on these indicators on, on income distribution as one of the worst of Latin America. And, 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 and moreover, uh, the... Um, I mean, the questions to, to the um, state institutions and to political parties, the, the trust that they have from uh, citizens, I mean, it's, it's concerning uh, that, they have, that the, the political parties have 4% of uh, legitimacy uh, and that 35% of the population only votes. So after elections, I mean, two large conglomerates reflect on who won, but, the, the real, but, but they, they won among 35% of the citizens, because 65% of the population, you couldn't say all of them, because there's some, I mean, uh, some sectors of society that are not interested, but a large part of it is questions the, the uh, legitimacy legitimacy of uh, institutions and parties. So, um, I don't know if I have answered your question, but, but there's these different ways of seeing why is it that it is necessary to have a new constitution. I personally believe that after 25 years, 
26 years after the restoration of democracy, uh, it is relevant to have a new uh, social agreement reflected on a legal instrument, on a juridical instrument, which is a constitution, which ends up a period in history that should be ended. Yeah. Um, my question is related about the indigenous uh, rights that should be included in the constitution. Uh, to talk about the example of uh, Ecuador and Bolivia, and my question is: in nations as Colombia that have a really, uh, really large diversity between uh, peoples and communities, and have not only indigenous people but uh, Afro descendant communities how we can ensure these rights about land and resources. Uh, also, Colombia, for example, is historically, the state is historically the owner of the natural resources. So how we can make this progress in the constitutions to include more rights of indigenous people, including rights uh, in natural resources without exclude other rights of development or another kind of desire of and other communities. Uh, in Colombia happens a lot, for example, the overlap between territories in indigenous people and Afro-descendant communities. So the pluralists of the constitution not only have to include more rights for, for indigenous people, for this kind of community, but a mechanism to really uh, harmonize all these conflicts. So I don't know if you're yeah. Oh, this is a really good, good question, and of course it's at the center of the debate on indigenous rights. Uh, uh, there are some views, uh, the, uh, the, some sectors of states, within states, uh, in Latin America, but all over. I'm coming from a conference in Canada, and, and, and this is a big issue in the debate on resource development and the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, and... and um, and of course, the, 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 the world constitution should reflect, would depend on this sovereign uh, body. Uh, and I refer to, in my presentation, to what is more complex, because if we acknowledge the existence of a right to self-determination and the constituent process should be based on that, Indigenous peoples have a very relevant role to play in that constituent process, as they have played in the con in several contexts of Latin America, including Colombia, where they had representatives in in, in the Constituent Assembly, Ecuador and, and Bolivia, and also in Venezuela. Um, there is um, there could be a tension between different options and, and rights, but my, from a human rights perspective, those rights are to be acknowledged and are to be included. The, the, at, at least the Latin American states, they have all, 12 Latin American states have ratified Convention 169 of the ILO, which acknowledges the existence, customary rights, rights to land based not on fee simple titles, but on traditional occupation, which makes a big difference, and the concept of Aboriginal title in the, in the context of Canada, Australia, uh, and rights to uh, autonomy. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, endorsed by all Latin American states, initially Colombia, abstained, but, but later on, uh, acknowledges the, the rights of the dimension. So these rights should be in, in the Constitution. The way to harmonize these rights with um, other goals that states may legit legitimately have uh, is a matter that has to, should also be in the Constitution, but, all, but moreover, I would say, in, in legislation and, and in the interpretation of courts. Um, so um, I don't know if that answered your question, but, uh, but finally a comment on, on the notion of development and good living, which is quite an interesting paradigm. Uh, and it's a matter of tension 
Uh, well, I've been following what's happening in uh, at um, uh, with, with this pipeline which is going through North Dakota, uh, through indigenous... Dakota. It's a Dakota. <laughs> yeah, through these territories. Of course, there's, there's a tension there uh, between the, the rights of those peoples that have lived there for long and, and, and these notions of, of development. Um, I think that states and these constitutional agreements I mean, these agreements, social, political, ethnic agreements reflected on constitutions should also open to different notions of living and not only uh, foster, as they have done, development as the only way to go, particularly when we know that development provides wealth, but on the other hand provides many problems that we're starting to face you know, globally. Thank you. We can stick around in the room for about 10 more minutes, but please join me in thanking.